everybody, good morning, happy Friday. Who forgot what day it was? I certainly did, but it's Friday everybody, it's Friday and we are here, Mozzie's here, up there, the book's here, I'm here, we're all here. Okay, um, so we uh, are, we've reached chapter 10 and I'm going to not read all of it um, because I think I'm finding that the shorter chunks of text are probably easier for you to listen to um, but do let me know if you think any different things um, but I think the shorter texts are easier so let's get cracking right chapter 10 the Manaus Museum of Natural History was very quiet this weekday morning the boy who swept the floors was outside weeding the flower beds the porter dozed in his cubicle and there were no visitors but in his lab behind the office Professor Glastonbury was worrying about the giant sloth he often worried about the sloth. For the past year, he had been putting the skeleton of the great beast together and it was going to make a most impressive exhibit. At least it should have done. For the truth was that the skeleton wasn't complete. It was nearly complete, but not quite. One rib was missing, the third rib on the left-hand side. Professor Glastonbury had made a false rib out of plaster of Paris and now he fitted it carefully into the breastbone and it looked fine. At least it did if you didn't know. The trouble was that the professor did know. He stood looking at his handiwork. The sloth on its metal stand seemed to fill the whole room. He took the rib out. He put it in again. He sighed. A false rib was cheating. But a missing rib was untidy. At that moment, he heard the creaking of the revolving doors and peering out, realised that two people had come into the museum whom he recognised. The tall, thin woman who had been interested in Bernard Taverner's collection and the schoolgirl who had been with her, a girl with a lot of dark hair and intelligent eyes. He came out of his office and said, good morning. The tall woman smiled and at once looked less alarming. This is Maya, she said. She's come to make some drawings of bird's wings. May I leave her here to work on her own? I'll fetch her at three o'clock. I don't think she'll be any trouble. I'm sure she won't, said the professor. He was still holding the false rib and looked distracted. What a large rib, said Miss Midson. Yes. He took a deep breath and poured out the problem of the missing bone. No one would know it was not the real one, he said. Miss Minton looked severe. You would know, she said. The professor sighed. That's what Taverner used to say. May we see it? The sloth? asked Maya. Certainly. He led them through his office and into the lab. It's not upside down, said Maya. I thought sloths always hung from trees. Not the giant sloths. They'd, they'd have splintered any tree they tried to hang from. This one would have weighed about three tons when it was alive, but they've been extinct for thousands of years. Once again, the professor put the rib in, and once again he took it out. What do you think? I think we should go and find the missing bone, said Miss Minton. The professor stared at her. Is she serious? Surely not. I'm afraid that's impossible, he said. The original skeleton came from a cave near the Canty River, miles away to the north, and I'm too old for expeditions. Nonsense, said Miss Minton. Anyone who can walk can go on, an expedi on expeditions. Then she took her leave and Maya said good morning to the stuffed Pekingese before she settled down at a table near the birds in flight exhibit and began to draw. It was good to be in the museum again and away from the castle. Not just the Pekingese, but the Amazonian river slug, the lumpy manatee, the shrunken head, all seemed like old, like old friends, and of course the Taverner collection, which she now saw with new eyes. And as she drew, Maya tried to puzzle out the problem of her governess. Maya had told Miss Minton that Clovis was safe with the Indian boy. Miss Minton had nodded, but she asked no more questions. It was strange how little she asked Maya about her comings and goings. When she pounced on every strand of unbrushed hair, or a fingernail not scrubbed to cleanliness. Then, when Maya said she needed to go and work in the museum to finish her project on Birds of the Rainforest, Minty had done no more than raise an eyebrow and had gone about arranging it. She had even persuaded Mrs Carter to let them go down on the rubber boat so as to give them more time in Manaus. And why did Finn want to know Miss Minton's Christian name? But she wasn't in the museum to think about Minty, or to even draw birds. She was here to do a job for Finn. And when she was sure the museum was empty, she walked over to the door marked private and knocked. Professor Glastonbury came out at once. He really was a very nice man with his round pink face and white fringe of hair. Sorry to disturb you again, said Maya, but I have a message for you. 
and she handed him the note that Finn had written in the park. The professor read it and looked at her intently. So she had found Finn and made friends with him. Not only that, but she wanted to help him. Yes, he said, I see. You are a messenger and to be trusted. Come in. He led her into his office and locked the door. Maya had never seen such a room. There wasn't a centimetre that wasn't covered in something. Limb casts, snake skins, jumble bones, the books everywhere, even on the floor. But it was a friendly clutter, not like the mess in Mr Carter's room. Sit down, he said, and moved a stuffed marmoset from the rickety chair. Then he read the note again. I don't see why not, if it's just for one night. No, I really don't see why not. He said you'd know, you knew a good hiding place. He said it, you showed it to him. Professor Glatton had a smile. He must have been close on 60, but he looked a, like a pleased pink baby. Ah, he remembered, did he? Well, come along. If Finn says you're to be trusted, I'm sure he's right. He took her into the lab, and for the second time, Maya was led to the giant slot. But this time, the professor put his shoulder to the heavy metal stand, which moved slowly to one side. On the wooden floor, grim, grimed with dirt, Maya could just make out a square of darker coloured wood and an iron ring. It's a trap door, he said. It leads down to a cellar and a storeroom, but it's well ventilated. It's got one high window. Best hiding place in the house, we used to say. Finn liked to play down there when he was little, while his father helped me. Maya stood looking up a flight of steps which led into the darkness. Would you like to go down? the professor asked. May I? Of course, but you better have a light. There's no electricity down there. He brought her a hurricane light and she climbed up. The cellar was huge and vaulted, with a recess at the back full of packing cases. Between the cases were exhibits which the professor had not had no room for, or those to be repaired, or for those to be, both those to be used. A beam of light fell on the red eyes of moth-eaten human. There were unstrung bows and painted shields and a harpy eagle sitting on a lopsided neck. In a corner was a heap of round objects which might have been carved coconuts, but may have been shrunken heads. But the floor was dry, and in the far end of him, a high window gave a glimmer of light. It's marvellous, said Maya, coming to him. No one could find you unless they knew. The professor moved the stand back over the trapdoor. I sometimes store Billy down there when the trustees come in on an inspection. I don't approve of stuff looking over in serious museums. There's just one more thing, said Maya, as the professor led her out of the lab. Finn thought that we should, that I should, steal the spare key so that no one gets into trouble. Your staff or you, if anything goes wrong. I doubt if anyone could do much to me, said Professor Glastonbury, but it's true, I wouldn't want my cleaners or my caretaker blamed. The trouble is, said Maya, looking up at him, I haven't actually stolen anything before. Well, there's always a first time, said the professor cheerfully. The spare keys are hanging on that hook over there, and I'm going out to lunch in half an hour. There she is, said Mr Trapwood, looking out of the window of the Pincher Maria at the slender blue funnel of HMS Bishop, the sister ship of the Cardinal, which had just come into port. She would spend four days on the turnabout while the crew cleaned the ship, took on supplies and had some time ashore. Then, on Saturday morning, she would set off again to the mouth of the Am uh, to the mouth of the Amazon, across the Atlantic, and back to Britain. The crows had been so sure of finding Taverner's son that they'd booked a three-berth cabin for the return journey. But they were beginning to give up hope, for it was clear that the wretched boy was deliberately hiding from them. At first, people tried to deny that Taverner had had a son at all. Now, though, they were beginning to laugh behind their sleeves. And as the day for the detective's departure grew closer, there were sly digs about the boy having outwitted them. But why? The crows were hurt. They'd come of bearers of good tidings to bring a savage jungle boy to the news of his inheritance. They'd been prepared to introduce him gradually to polite society, perhaps on the journey to teach him to use a knife and fork. Sir Aubrey had even given them some money to buy him clothes in case he'd been brought up in a grass skirt. And they had expected gratitude. It was only natural. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, the boy would have said, grasping them by the hand. And thank you, Mr. Trapwood. You've saved me from a life of toil and darkness. Instead of that, the boy was deliberately hiding and everyone in Manaus seemed to be helping him. We've got three more days, said Mr. Trapwood. There's still a chance to flush him out. To carry him aboard by force if necessary. 
to get the bonus from Sir Aubrey. That was the most important thing of all. Sir Aubrey had promised them £100 each if they brought his grandson home safely. I still think there was something fishy about that pigtail girl at the Carter's place, Miss Lillard agreed. She had a shifty look. We'll have to keep an eye on her. The crows were looking very much the worse for wear. Their black suits were dusty and torn. The maid at the Pension Maria had burnt every one of their shirts as she ironed them. Mr Trackwood's face was covered in lumps where the bites of the tabernid fly had gone septic and both their stomachs had become boiling caverns, caverns of agony and weariness. But we can still do it, said Mr Trackwood, crunching the table. We'll try down river this time. Those houses by the fishing place. The people there look poor enough. They should take some notice of the reward. Mr Lowe nodded and made his way stealthily towards the door. If you're thinking of getting to the lavatory before me, don't try, said Mr Trackwood. I'm going first. No, you aren't. I need it. You need it. Shoving and jostling, the two detectives raced each other down the corridor. Okay. Right, that's where we're going to read up to today. I think that's quite a nice way to stop. Um, but yeah, I hope you're still enjoying it. I really, really love this book and I'm really hoping that we um, get to actually teach it and do it with you. Um, fingers crossed. We can't really do anything else, can we? Other than hope and wish. But I hope you're all okay. Um, and another thing I was going to say was I'm sure you've all seen the um, Captain Tom doing his walk that I think he's now over 15 million pounds that he's raised and I know that there is something online somewhere where people are going to try and make him a birthday card um, and then use a hashtag post it online somehow so if your grown-ups have not heard of it get them to um, google um, birthday cards Captain Tom I imagine and uh, if they're on any sort of social media they can you can hold up the card for him um, because it's quite an achievement, I think you'll agree. Not sure I would want to do a hundred laps of um, a garden, um, especially when I was going to be a hundred. I think I'd struggle now. Um, but anyway, that might be a quite nice thing to do over the weekend if you um, if you're struggling to think of things to do. And also, don't forget that uh, you were sent or there is available, I think, on Parent Mail, um, the list of spring activities um, as well that you could be doing. Um, so yeah, hope you're managing to keep busy and you're keeping your brains active um, and I will continue reading this um, next week and keep posting them up here. Okay, lots of love. Missing you all. See you soon. Bye.